Hi, this is a presentation on automated registration systems. So according to Dale McLachlan, land registration systems provide the means for recognising formalised property rights and for regulating the character and transfer of these rights. And this is framed within the, the, the legal system. Uh, we've described kind of these fundamental primitives uh, of parties' rights and land and how they uh, reflect state in terms of title or, or search. And we're now going to discuss how these party rights and land uh, relationships can change, defined through the transactional processes that describe what rights can be created, varied or discharged by parties with the appropriate legal power, with the support of legally competent stakeholders who can submit change requests to the registrar, who uses rejection rules to determine whether the change can be registered or not. This work is going to focus on digital approaches uh, and we're going to use the application record as the vehicle that conceptually presents a legal instrument deed for consideration for registration. In fact, uh, the application record itself will be used to create both the deed and render the change. Uh, and in order for a transaction to be successful, it needs to be logical. So a transaction represents a change to a party right and land relationship, or a party right or land relationship. Uh, and so theoretically, a successful transaction should be both valid and logically sound. As a valid transaction, the slots representing the respective party right and land change should be filled with valid entities. And these valid entities should make sense. So, for example, a grantor on a transaction must have the power to authorise the transaction on the register. Uh, otherwise, uh, it, it's it's you know you have that uh, position of, of Nemo Dat. Someone is trying to sell what they do not own. For example. Okay. Now, we've talked about party right and land primitives representing state. So each jurisdiction has its own legal framework to find these kind of fundamental primitives. Uh, and this really goes down to the parties who hold rights which are defined in land. From these registered legal facts, we can determ determine legal impact. So who owns the land, what the owner must not do on the land, what benefits the owner has over other land, and what benefits third parties have over the owner's land. So you see these different rights relationships playing out over the owned land. And these are a reflection of the first holder, order of holding in rights instance of privilege and claim. However, we've not discussed how we can change these legal facts. So changes to these party right and land relationships are represented using transactions on the register. And the second order of held in uh, rights instance of immunity and power are used to change these rights, uh, rights relationships, including decreation, variation and discharge. So when you're varying something, you can start to alienate rights, you can do subdivisions, or you can change details. You can also deal with the transfer elements, you can change the party, uh, or uh, where that right is an ownership, you can deal with a, a discharge element. So in terms of these Hofheldian incidents, the secondary rules, um, they specify how agents can introduce uh, and change primary rules. So this powers, the Heldian power is the instant that enables agents to alter primary rules. So A has a power if and only if A has the ability to alter her own or another's Hofheldian instance. So an owner has the power to alter their real right and land by transfer or variation or any combination of the above. An owner cannot discharge land, although in some jurisdictions an owner can abandon land. And then there are immunities. When A has the ability to alter B's have held in instance, then A has a power. When A lacks the ability to alter B's have held in instance, then B has an immunity. So B has an immunity if and only if A lacks the ability to alter B's have held in instance. So again, it gets down to you cannot sell what you do not own. Um, in terms of conceptual transactional theory, Henson described four general principles that underpin transactions within land registers. The booking principle, implying that the real rights transaction has no legal effect until the change is registered. The publicity principle, implying that the legal registers are open for public inspection. The consent principle, implying that the registered party holding the real right gives their consent for the transaction, getting back to that power of Heldian power and immunity element. And the specificity principle, implying that the transactional subjects, the parties' rights and land as part of a transaction, can be unambiguously identified. 
Now, this doesn't mean that each land register has to adhere to each principle, but many do. Uh, Zevenbergen and Ploger, sorry about pronunciation, see the principles as a means to differentiate between jurisdictional approaches. We agree with this, but believe that the juris uh, judicial approaches to error correction, error correction and bidural in inaccuracies also play a significant role, and we talk about this in another presentation. The consent principle, uh, implying that the registered party holding the real right gives their consent for the transaction, is critical. So the party that is registered as holding the real right is generally the only party with powers to change that right. The right holding party has an immunity against third parties waiving, nulling, or transferring their registered right. This is, again is in particularly important for owners. If land is sold without the consent of a landowner, then there's been register error or fraud. And the specificity principle implies that the transactional subjects must be unambiguously identified. We describe a, a title as being came by three, uh, three key elements, the party, the who, the ownership right, the what, over a plot of land, the where, and then extended by party right land relationships that benefit or encumber that land. Party verification and designation during registration allows us to identify the who. The legislation framework, in terms of uh, numerous clauses, allows us to identify the what, and what is missing is a, is a mechanism to uniquely identify the where. And this tends to be uh, covered from the set of cadastral units, which can be absolute, i.e. provided with uh, accurate geometry, or relative, i.e. Uh, verbalizations grounded in, in a geometric system, which collectively produce of a spatial uh, view of those is referred to as the cadastral map. So the unambiguous identification of these transactional subjects essentially implies that the ideal land register will be built on three component parts. A register of rights, real rights in land are numerous clauses as we saw in a, or we may see in one of the presentations. Uh, the specificity of parties' rights and land, so a register of owned and p or possessed land, so you uniquely identify a registered spatial units, um, this is managed by the registrar, uh, and a register of parties, uniquely identical parties that can directly or indirectly hold real rights in land, including natural, non-natural uh, and registered spatial units, and each of these component parts can be transacted against. And hence this digital land register consists of relationship tuples described, describing party, right and land, and they can be indexed accordingly. And each of those tuples is intrinsically spatial. Two principal indexes are required to efficiently structure a modern digital land register. A party index, uh, and this is used to efficiently identify, eff sorry, efficiently identify pertinential benefits, i.e. where a unit of land has rights, uh, uh, as a, is a right holder uh, over other land, or as a spatial index, so you can see where uh, spatial rights encumber uh, another piece of land. Okay, how do we start to describe these change? Well, we use transactional instruments, and these are jurisdictional, dependent, and used to legally instruct registrars to make change to the register. Uh, these are normally legal instruments, uh, a deed or contract, but can be less formal. Uh, a transactional instrument for a land register describes, describes specific rights relationships between a granting party, a right holder, a grantee party, the benefiter, uh, over an area of land. It can represent multiple rights granted to multiple parties over multiple areas of land, as long as the grant has the power to make the rights changes. Um, so what are these things called? So it doesn't matter whether a transactional instrument is formal or informal or even a legal instrument. The key element here is that the transactional instrument is a vehicle for change. So as we will see, change drives everything and we'll t articulate this in a manner which is machine readable, human readable and legally competent. Yeah, depending upon what the jurisdiction requires as legally competent. Henceforth, we'll use the term deed for these transactional instruments. And so we can see our deeds allowing us to do creation, variation, or discharge. And we'll go into those things in a bit more detail again later on. So these transactional instruments of change act like APIs. So um, it means that you can define change 
create vario discharge, a thing which is of interest for parties and is of, is of interest for registration body, in this instance registrable spatial right, and is legal, so it's executed, witnessed and delivered. So a transactional instrument can produce its create operation, a new party right land relationship by alienating rights or multiple party right land relationships within that same instrument, a variation, and this would be against an instrument which has already been registered. The variation does not need to affect all the rights in an instrument. Some of the rights can be discharged, so it allows you to have quite a nuanced approach to a change of a discharge, so you, you just completely discharge an instrument that's already been registered. So for example a, a, a security, you've taken out a mortgage, then it's been paid off and that mortgage is discharged. So there is a life cycle of these transactional instruments. So it, uh, it does not initially uh, need to appear fully formed, it's part of the process. Initially these transactional instruments will start out of draft, as these, these are applications that are yet to be submitted, and once it's submitted uh, an application, for, sorry, the registrar will review that application and uh, either accept it or reject it based upon rules. Once it's accepted, it becomes a registered deed. Um, once it's registered, it could be very discharged or, or voided. Uh, and, excuse me, I'm going to sneeze. And there is an archive element as well where rejected voided and discharged uh, information is uh, retained. And then there are a number of primitive um, operations that can be undertaken um, uh, using transactions as long as you have the appropriate powers. So you can have a sale, which we would class as a transfer of party. You can have a rights alienation, which is a transfer of right, and that rights alienation could be ownership and non-ownership, um, where you have sub-ownership rights. Uh, or it could be an ownership subdivision, which referred to as a, a transfer of land. And this is summarised in this illustration. So here you've got your uh, transfer of party. So we're changing our party for a new party. Here we're alienating some ownership rights. So this is to create a block of flats over the land. Uh, or we're going to alienate a, a, a right of access or someone has already actually alienated a mortgage and now you want to discharge it or a, a transfer of land here um, which is a subdivision of this land right and we can see those summarized here so we have a transfer of party part uh, which is uh, where part of that land is being sold uh, so in terms of its party ownership so it's a 50% for example, or a transfer of party whole, which is selling the whole interest in the land. A transfer of right part, where you're subdividing a right out of your bundle of rights model, uh, and this instance to separate out a strata, or a transfer of right whole. Here, this covers the whole footprint and is for the security. And your transfer of land. This only has a part. Uh, you can't conceptually really deal with the transfer of land whole because it would just destroy land, although you could use it as a conceit for uh, renumbering the register. Okay, we have now provided quite a lot of the background in terms of our modelling concepts. We've talked about parties, rights, primary, subordinate, a whole raft of different stuff. So we'll now get into what is the meat of this presentation, which is to deal with this uh, in an automated way. We've got a, a UML model in the back end, so we've got parties, parties who hold rights, and those rights are defined in land, and we have an application table. So we've got a five-table uh, UML model. Um, we've defined a, a conceptual approach uh, where we start with a block of land owned by a regional development agency. Applications are submitted for developers to specific areas. So we've got two development areas, which will ultimately have a, a whole raft of terraces and garages uh, and communal access, and then flats with verbalized or spatially represented components, communal areas. Uh, we will pull together all of those deeds uh, to make that transaction work and it uses all of the primitives that we've just talked about okay so our first element is going to be a digital transaction exemplar so this is first registration uh, we're going to transfer of land part a tulp and a transfer of party whole uh, and we'll demonstrate we'll also show how versioning works in here so we'll have our our you know initial rubber sheet as it were ultimately leading to this new development so we have some 
Python libraries. So all of this will be done live. Uh, we'll create the data model from the UML and we will import that into our database and we'll deal with our first registration. It does that all the time. Uh, so we're going to insert our deed. And then we'll view the application here. So here we've got a disposition, and this is the first registration. I we're bringing something into the register, so it isn't one of these transfers. This is a, another conceit. Uh, we're just bringing in a piece of principal land that's been granted by the state, uh, state to the regional development agency. Uh, it's 100% ownership, one over one fraction. It uh, is this. It has this geometry contained in this well-known text, and it has this special number LRC001. Okay, let me just check out of here. I need to trust this. It's unfortunate. Okay. All right, here we are. Ah, okay, so and um, what this does, it creates the deed from the application, so it wraps it around with boilerplate. Now, I appreciate this isn't the way that things are normally done, uh, but this is a way that you can do this in terms of automating uh, registration. So use the application element to have all of your key data nodes that represent change, uh, and you can use that to wrap up and create your deed. So you're owning the language of registration. So registration, more time passes. This is the first registration, manual approval is required. Uh, and the deed tells us that the state has an exclusive one term fraction of this kind of principal ownership right over the land defined by the geometry. And so we can create the following. We can create the party. So we look at the application record and we do a SQL insert uh, using information that's there. And there we are, we now have this party called the Regional Development Agency. So let's just show you again, nothing up my sleeve, nothing in that database table. We'll now add the land in. And again, this is using information from that application table. And we've now inserted that into our database. Again, nothing in our table. We're just inserting the data in, hooray. And then we hold the party that owns that interest. So we're inserting all of the information into the database based upon the, uh, the information indeed. We're now complete the application, so we're doing our own housekeeping, so we change the status field, we say it's accepted, and as this has got to deal with land, and we're moving the land through to our cadastral model, this deed has now essentially served its purpose and can be archived. So we can see here that this application model uh, actually deals with multiple elements of the life cycle. So it deals with the application record, deals with the archive record, and it reflects the deed register, all in one instance. So we have this land register, this registered legal instruments plus registered rights. There are four tables there. We'll uh, run some views over this so we can summarize the data. Here we are. Uh, and by summarizing the data, let me zoom out a little. In fact, let's go up and down. There we are. We can see that we have now created this polygon in the data for this principal land. It has a title number of LRC001, uh, which is an exclusive right to the regional development agency. We haven't told it's an exclusive right. It's actually um, calculated that because there's only one party who's there. So we're now going to transfer out uh, a development plot to Mrs. Money for Developer. And this is a transfer of uh, land part followed by a transfer of party whole, as we described earlier on. So we'll insert our application and then we'll have a look at it. So this is for our terrace community development. It's a tuple. Uh, transfer of land part or tulp uh, and it's principal land from the regional development agency. And it's going to go to Miss Money for Developer with a one to one fractional denominator. There is, uh, it's coming from a parent cadastral unit, LRC001, the one we've just created. And there is some cookie cutter element uh, geometry here, which means we can cookie cut from that land to create new geometry, which is brilliant. So the transfer of, of uh, land part um, 
Cookie cuts out that land and a transfer of party whole, uh, transfer the ownership from regional development to Miss Money for Developer. And we've wrapped this up all within a single sequence from those two atomic privatives. And here we are. We can create our deed that represents this. And clearly we'd have a, a much more um, inclusive text than what I've put on there. So this application is approved on the same day. So we can now do the following tasks. We can add the new party. We can cut a cut the new land and we can register a new cadastral unit. So let's do that. Again, that isn't in there. Now it is. So we now have Miss Money for Developer. Uh, this is using proper spatial predicates in there to deal with the cut, uh, cookie cutting. Uh, and we notice that we have two cadastral units for IC001 uh, for the previous deed up until this current deed has been put in, and then for LSE001 now that that cookie cutting has been put out. You'll also notice that the versioning occurs at the fine granularity, whether it's a party version, a right version, or a land version, and this is versioning at the land level. So, likewise, here's the new land being added in. We add the rights in land. We add the principal land. Oh, and we add it all through. And likewise, we complete the application and we do the final housekeeping. And there we are. We see that. Oh. You know, this has all been added through and accepted. So, let's have a look at the state of our cadastral map. So there we are, we've cut, cut out this uh, development agency, sorry, this uh, area for Mrs. Money for Developer. But we're now masters of space and time because we've got our version database. We can see that we have uh, two views of that cadastral unit pre and post uh, the uh, transfer of land part. So we've got the current version, where we've got the geometric hole in it. We've got a, and we can turn back time, so we can see the previous version, and then you can see a comparison between the two. So we're great. We are masters of space and time, for those of you who like Doctor Who. So we've shown that kind of conceptual approach of how we go through a couple of applications. Now let's go for the big reveal. Uh, I'm just going to check that. I actually have, uh, yeah, let's trust this notebook and try it again. So we're going to go for the full batch automation now. Uh, we'll start with this, uh, we'll end with this, we'll have all the deeds that make this a keep, you know, in your mind's eye a view of this end state. We'll bring in our libraries, we'll bring in our spatial database, we'll bring in our code. We will show you what the cadastral map looks like, first of all, once it's actually done all of that stuff, which is there is nothing in it. We will show how those digital applications can become deeds. This is creating that initial rubber sheet. There you are, you've seen this before. That's that initial deed that reflects that. And then we'll process this. So here we now have a batch processor. And that's great. So we now have our land in here that are, is our background rubber sheet, our universe, if you will. And now we've got another 60 odd deeds we're going to process. And these represent deeds of real burdens. So there's a smokeless zone restriction. We'll start dealing with uh, dispositions, deed of standard securities, um, a whole raft of different stuff to create those developments. We'll process the whole lot. And at the tail end, we can have a look at our cadastral map. Hey, so if you can cast your mind's eye back to how it was, and I'm sorry the rendering on this isn't great, you can see we now have a whole raft of different uh, cadastral units. We can have a look at those by party. So we can see who owns what. So there's rights in common for LRC00. Three for a, a one twelfth fraction. In fact, all of these things have a one twelfth fraction over this common area uh, where the terraces have been built. Uh, it's got proper geometry. It's got proper holes in it, and we can use this to derive title. So here, 
is a terrace solo with garage development so this is one of those terraces in the top piece uh, it's a piece of principal land it is a square not very exciting but because you own LRC 003 we can find out what ownership pertinence you have well in this instance you get a one-to-one -one, a exclusive ownership of LRC 004 which is this garage down here the main plot is here uh, and you get LRC002 1 12th interest as we saw earlier in this uh, common area here which is the access way. What other beneficial rights do you get? Well we've got a spatial relationship with a community deed which is a servitude here which uh, has both sides so this is one where uh, you are benefit and encumbered by shared gables, utilities that kind of stuff. Basically the wall that you share with your next door neighbour, uh, you're benefited from the fact that that wall exists and you can use it. You're also encumbered by that so that your neighbour can use it as well. Who owns it? It's Mr Block the Builder. Uh, what's the securities? Ooh, there's a security over this for £500,000 for Miss Money for Developer. Oh dear, um, we should be you know, potentially quite worried about this. I have no idea how this transaction went on. But the thing is, this is just demonstrating the fact that you can query it via a spatial relationship. Uh, but also there are encumbrances, restrictions and responsibilities. Uh, and there is a smokeless zone issue that has a spatial relationship with our ownership extents and the servitude here, which is that reciprocal relationship for the, the shared gables. And that's it. Um, thank you very much. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it.